All right. I, you know, I was going through my videos the other day, and I realized that I start every single video with all right. So, uh, I need a new opener. Put a pin on that. So, we talked about uh, Titus and and First Timothy, which you know Paul is released out of prison at this point. We are we are we are after the book of Acts. You know, Acts ends with with Paul, not Peter. I'm sorry, Paul in captivity. Okay. He's released probably somewhere around like 63 maybe, and uh, you know he writes Titus and First Timothy, um, and then he goes off you know Spain and and maybe even England over there and stuff. Then he comes back and is rearrested. Okay, when he is rearrested is when Second Timothy is re written. Okay, but First Peter is written probably right before the persecution in uh, under Emperor Nero starts. Um, if you guys remember that, I, I kind of referenced that. So that starts in 64 and ends in, I think, like 68 or something when Emperor Nero kills himself. Um, and that's when P First Peter is written right about the start of that, maybe right before. Uh, and so Second Timothy is written, obviously, uh, after that when Paul is arrested sometime around like 67, I guess. I don't know. Um, and then Second Peter is, is written sometime when, whenever Peter is, is killed. But Second Timothy and Second Peter, we really can't date specifically. Yeah, so, if that's the case, because it really just depends on when they died. Um, so, as far as First Peter, this was written by Peter, obviously, which brings up the question: How could he have had such good Greek if you know he was you know a poor fisherman? Well, there's a few things. First off, it shouldn't be ignored that the Greek setting, you know. It doesn't seem totally improbable that people would have would know two languages. That doesn't seem totally improbable. Um, you know, uh, once again, it seems like the majority of people, for instance, when Jesus is on the cross, he says something, and I think it's Aramaic, and um, a good majority of the people are like, what? What's he saying? See, they didn't even know what he was saying. So, <coughs> at least Jesus knew, at least in part, two or more languages. Um, although probably spoke, people were probably speaking. I mean, I would imagine Greek. Um, um, but I believe at this point Hebrew is is pretty much dead and gone. I, if I'm remembering correctly, I think it started to die out um, about the time of the exile, if I remember correctly. And then um, by this time, um, very few, if any, knew it. Greek was the was the main language, um, but it seems like. A good majority of people also spoke Aramaic, especially in the Palestine area and, and around there. So, okay, let's say Peter um, grew up and, and everybody spoke Aramaic, okay? Does that necessitate him not knowing Greek? No, not necessarily. I know a lot of um, Mexicans, um, not Hispanics in broadly, but specifically Mexicans um, around the areas that I live um, who can speak English and Spanish and can write in both and have no problem with that. So it's not beyond the realm of possibility. Also, don't forget that it is also possible that he used an amanuensis, I mean, or a combination of these two things. I mean, there, 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 is, uh, there are other options than just simply saying he did not write it. Um, plus, keep in mind that this uh, people who say that Peter um, didn't write it are just speculating. It's not necessarily based on anything, just speculation. Um, so the audience, it, he actually says there at the beginning of, of, the, le of the letter, um, the Christians in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Basically, Turkey, Western Turkey area. And it seems like they were mar uh, largely Gentile. Okay. Uh, written about 63 just before Emperor Nero starts persecuting Christians. Okay, remember, there's a fire in Rome about 63 or 64, I think it's 64, and so he blames the Christians, and so they start being persecuted. So anyways, um, the context, Peter writes from Rome to teach doctrine about Christ. Now remember, Peter at some point uh, traveled to Rome, maybe he traveled around before he went to Rome, maybe uh, he went straight to Rome, maybe he went to Rome and then went back for the Jer Jerusalem Council and went back to Rome, I, I don't know. It's it's kind of hard to know absolutely, but he did something, <laughs> and he ended up in Rome. Um, he mentions Rome as uh, Babylon, 
which obviously he's not talking about literal Babylon as Babylon was destroyed at the time of the writing, so really we can bet that it wasn't Babylon. Um, so, anyways. Um, some special characteristics. Uh, he mentions a painful trial. Um, this could very easily be metaphorical flames. I know a lot of people have said, oh, we have to date it to a certain time because he's talking about literal flames. Not necessarily. It could just as easily be metaphorical flames. Um, also, don't forget, don't ever forget that there was Je Jewish and Gentile harassment. Um, as, as, it, as time went on and Jerusalem was destroyed in the 70s and um, Israel, Israelites were kind of just, I don't know, became less and less prominent, um, it, it, harassment usually went to, went, became more from the, the pagans than from the um, Jews, okay? Um, also, keep in mind that the people he's writing to, as is the case for a lot of the New Testament, they don't have a Christian background. They don't have a Jewish background a lot of the times. Um, they were part of these pagan practices, and then they come, came out of that. That was their background. Okay, and as far as, you know, how in America we have the whole, you know, there's some people who America is a Christian nation, and other people are just like, not really. Um, it, with Rome, it, it wasn't... It, the, <laughs> The things that made you Roman, like the thing, you know, what makes you American is, you know, this or that. What made you Roman was, you know, the imperial cult and that kind of stuff. And, and just the, 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 the atmosphere and the different things that, that, that you did with that. Um, you know, and that was their background. It's not like they had a hit heritage of, of, of faith or anything. They were, they were pagans. And they heard the message of Christ and they believed, and that's what they came out of. Um, the main theme of, per, of First Peter seems to be perseverance despite persecution. Okay, um, uh, First Peter, I think, is oftentimes overlooked for the really valuable um, thing that it really is. Two five says, "You also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices accepted to God through Jesus Christ." Um, so he's talking about ways to respond to um, the persecution. And the first thing he says is respond with community, you know, uh, respond with togetherness. A whole, uh, you know, a, a, a priesthood, uh, um, offering, uh, offering spiritual sacrifices. Um, he's talking about them, you know, be, uh, being uh, built up, in, uh, um, the, what did you say, the cornerstones and stuff being built up, um, re refers to them like a community, a household. Um, but obviously, don't take the take what he's saying here with the whole priesthood too far as the Mormons have. I mean, it's just unnatural to take it and apply it like that. Seems how really remember Jesus is the great high priest, and I don't really have time to get into that. Two twelve um, says, uh, "Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God in the day He visits us." Um. Once again, another way to respond towards the persecution is with proper conduct. And 3, 4. Rather, it should be that of your inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. Once again, you know, this, this backs up what was said in 1 Timothy, if, if, if he's talking about wives in 1 Timothy. Um, wives shouldn't be contentious, basically, which is kind of the same thing we got from 1 Timothy. Um so, you know, obviously Paul desired for women to learn to keep them from being, um, to learn to keep them from being um, uh, deceived, and they should be submitted to their husband because he was formed first. So that makes, that makes sense. But if he's talking about um, man and, and, and woman it is in the sense of um, leadership in the church, first off, it doesn't really fit because he hasn't even started talking about leadership yet. So it really doesn't fit. But then also... It, it's kind of so you're saying that women shouldn't lead because a man was created first. Women shouldn't be in ministry because of that. That that just doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. I would have actually depended on more of examples to prove your point, not not so much the order of creation. I mean, eh, I mean, he could be saying that. It just doesn't seem like he is. And so I think all that I'm getting at here is it seems like a little bit of a stretch to say Paul is definitely talking about women shouldn't be in ministry. It's too rushed of a conclusion. 
Maybe he's talking about that. But we shouldn't say so absolutely when the more, most natural reading seems like he's talking about man and wife, especially in light of the way that he switches terms from the, the, the general term, meaning more uh, women should be doing this, to a woman. Now, obviously, yes, Paul has used the term a woman in other areas that, to, to do that. But given the context, it seems more natural that he's just switching from um, women generally to wives. Once again, though, let's uh, not push it too far there. Um, <clears throat> so that takes us to 3.7. Husbands, in the same way, be considered as you live with your wives and treat them with respect as the weaker partner and as heirs with you of the gracious gift of life so that nothing will har uh, hinder your prayers. Once again, those people who are, have already made up their mind that, that, that women are not able to lead, um, it kind of rests your conclusion on this. What he, it seems like he's saying is, is um, weaker in the sense of they, they are submitting. Remember, he just talked about that with the women. They are voluntarily submitting, right? So that weaker in that sense. Um, I don't have time to get into the, whole, the Greek and everything, but it seems like that's what he's talking about. It, it doesn't really follow that he's saying um, women are uh, less um, less able to deal with things. It just doesn't follow. I mean, it's possible that he is talking about that, but the most natural reading is he's not. Um, it also mentions here that... Um, that uh, that they, that the husband's prayers could be hindered, in other words, refused, okay, uh, by doing this. So once again, keep that in mind whenever you're pushing for stuff like that. Three nineteen. After being made alive, he went and, pro and made proclamation to them prison spirits. Now there have been a lot of different views. Whatever view you take, you cannot take the view that there was a second chance for those people who died and went to hell. Okay. Um. Whatever view you take. Now, if Christ really did go to this, to some people say, I'll, I'll start with the last one, Christ telling Old Testament saints. Basically, this view says that the Old Testament saints, um, they didn't go to hell, but they didn't go to heaven. They just went to this place that, you know, sometimes refer to it as paradise. Sometimes you just refer to this kind of, like, almost like a purgatory. The problem with this is when Jesus is telling the parable, it kind of seems like he's talking about heaven. Uh, once again, possibly not, but... Eh. Um, also, um, when he talks about Abraham, the, the, the Lazarus being in the bosom of Abraham, uh, could, could, he could be talking about this mystical paradise place, but without nowhere in Scripture does it clearly say that. You know, and, and, and once again, Jesus says, today you will be with me in paradise. Uh, and then Paul talks about and talk, Paul talks about the the in the heaven and everything, uh, the paradise and all that. And then in Hebrews it says that you know it's appointed man once to die and then to and then the judgment. It it, it doesn't really seem like the, the problem with this last view is you have to make an entire doctrine that the Old Testament saints went somewhere somewhere besides hell uh, or heaven, hell or heaven. Okay. This would also negate what Paul says in Romans about they were saved through 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 faith, but by doing by doing the works of the law. Um, you know, he says that they made it into a thing about the, the work it being work centered, but it wasn't meant to be like that, um, implying that the people in the Old Testament were say could be saved as well, and that they weren't saved by the Old Testament laws so much as by the grace of God through faith. Um, if that's the case, then why wouldn't they have gone to heaven? See, it, 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 it just kind of, kind of makes up these things that, that, that really has no basis. And, and why would Christ go to the Old Testament saints and proclaim to them proclaim to them what? See what I mean? It just doesn't make sense. So it, it, be careful about forming one doctrine off of, off of something like that. Two other uh, options that, are, that, are, that seem a whole lot more likely. Um, Christ was maybe declaring victory to the demons or to the angelic beings. You know, okay, that, there's something that's the take Craig Blomberg takes. My personal favorite, though, is one presented by Wayne Grudem. I don't know if it's presented by others, but I know it is presented by Wayne Grudem. Um, Christ was preaching through Noah um, in the times of, of the flood. That seems very na a very natural reading, okay? Um, it seems, in my opinion, very natural. Craig Blomberg uh, rests on the whole, either proclaiming to the demons or the angelic beings or whatever, um, because of the word um, there used for the spirits. Um, 
he has a good argument. I just it just doesn't to me it doesn't seem to follow the train of thought. I mean I could obviously be wrong, but I personally side with Wayne Grudem, and I personally don't see it as Christ telling these Old Testament saints because you have to make up this place, um, this paradise purgatory place, and you don't have a clear doctrine on that, and you should never establish a doctrine on vague passages. Um, so then four six. Um, for this is the reason the gospel was preached even to those who are now dead. Don't never forget this. Scripture interprets scripture. Never forget that. Um, for this is the reason the gospel was preached even to those who are now dead, so that they might be judged according to human standards in regard to the body, but live according to God in regard to the spirit. See what he's saying here. Now the NIV. This is the 2011 NIV. Um, kind of did the work for you, but in some of your translations, you're gonna say. He, because this is how the Greek actually says, is he went and proclaimed to the dead or something like that. Um, basically, it seems be, letting Scripture justify itself and what the rest of the passage is talking about. Talking about there, it seems like he's saying um, these Christians who were saved, you know, be, be welcomed in eternal life. Okay, and, and yes, they, they were killed later on, but they were able to have eternal life, um, even though they were even though they were killed. Um, so kind of the idea that they are now dead, but they weren't dead when they were preached to. I mean, once again, things can kind of clarify itself here. The end of all things is near, therefore be alert and of sober minds that you may pray. Above all, love each other deeply because love uh, covers over multitudes of sins. So first off, notice the, what he says about prayer. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each one of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others. As faithful stewards of God's grace in his various forms, if anyone speaks, they should do so, do so as one who speaks in the very words of God. If anyone uh, serves, they should do so with the strength God provides, that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. Um, <clears throat> So for, it seems like he's, he's talking about sort of things that are the natural reaction to suffering. The end of all things, therefore be alert and have sober mind. You know, what happens when we get bogged down with stuff? Um, love each other deeply. How, what happens when we get bogged down with stuff? So, uh, why is Rome called Babylon something that, that, that people are kind of confused with? With the Old Testament, they, they try to make Babylon completely, um, completely uh, metaphorical. Whereas in the New Testament, sometimes they try to make it overly literal. Eh. We'll get to that when we get to Revelations, but first off, Babylon is oftentimes, and Rome is oftentimes referred to Babylon because of the similarities. Um, Caesar was, and the imperial cult was Lord, was called Lord and Savior, and um, he had to be worshipped. That was like pretty much the, the immutable law of being Romans. Um, obviously there were some who were like let, um, free of that, such as the Jews. Um, <clears throat> But then also there was the pagan there was the pagan worship in general and just the different uh, the different cults and those kinds of things. Um, there was uh, immoral living. Um, I don't think I really need to elaborate on these things. A very worldly philosophy, much as the much as the same as today. Um, violence, uh, hedonism, you know, lustful living, just really um, a lack of discretion. And so uh, some of the old uh, New Testament writers refer to it as Babylon. Um, because it has so much in common with Babylon, who, once again, Babylon becomes a symbol of evil. Um, so 2 Timothy, Paul is is, is re, re-arrested, okay, probably around like 64 to 68, some, somewhere in there. Remember, we're not dating this specifically. Um, and yet, once again, written to Timothy, it seems like it was more written just for Timothy, not necessarily for the whole church of Ephesus. Um, it seems like it's more of Paul's last testament. Um, Paul, in his second Roman imprisonment, gives his last testament to Timothy. The last thing that he has to say, passing the torch. Here you go. You know, I'm. I'm. This is the end of my time. It's. 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 It's, the, it's the time for you to go and do these things. Um, some special characteristics. It is a personal letter to Timothy, um, and you just see in, in the midst of loneliness and adversity, you see faith and hope, which is what we should be handing down to those people who are training. Faith and hope in the midst of loneliness and adversity. Don't forget that you parents too. Um, whenever you're in in the in bad circumstances, let your kids see faith and hope. Let them see you pray and read your read your Bible. Um, the main theme seems to be always be ready to pass it on, or always pass it on. The core of it is pass it on, but then 
always pass it on because he talks about it kind of being a process like that. But then he says, be ready in and out of season. You know, he, it seems like he's more talking about an extent, extended and taking in all the all the letter together. Always be ready to pass it on. So, um, regardless of whether you, you you do or not, but do pass it on. Um, so difficult passages. I hope that you got what I was saying there. Second Timothy. One fifteen. You know that everyone in the province of Asia has deserted me, including uh, I don't know how to say that word, uh, Phygelus and Hermogen Hermogenes. <laughs> Whoops. Um, maybe if I saw it in Greek, I would be able to to understand it. But sometimes the transliterations really mess me up. Um, Um, he, it seems like he's not necessarily saying everyone in Asia, all of Western Turkey, but so much everyone from there who was there with him, all of them uh, had, had abandoned him. That's what it seems like he, he's saying, not literally everyone in Asia. Um, but uh, keep in mind that, that, that you know he had had, an, had a hearing, and it didn't go very well, um, at least by human standards, and things weren't looking very, very well. Um, tradition places him at a very brutal prison. Um, and just a lot of a lot of bad things happening. Um, two two and the things you have heard um, you say in the presence of many witnesses and trust to the reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. See once again that passing it on. Um, two fifteen. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. Talking about having a, having a good focus in the things that you do in your ministry. Um, 3 1. Uh, but mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. Now keep in mind that the last days started with Christ's ascension and it has been going on ever since. Okay, so I know a lot of times nowadays people get way wrapped up in the. We are in the end times. Well, of course we're in the end times. We've been in the end times since Christ left. And nobody knows the hour, nor nor the day, or the, the moment that, that, that Jesus will come back. He will come back, though. Peter talks about this. Um, so, uh, 3.13, When you come, bring the cloak that I left with, with Carpus, Atreus, and my scrolls, especially the parchments. Um, I'm sorry, I think I'm in 4.13. Yeah, there I am. 3.13, sorry. While evildoers and impostors will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. Um, it seems like things will continue to get worse uh, overall. There will be times of nothing worse, but and the ministry. It seems like this is the the, the, the way ministry that then times is, is going to keep on going. Uh, people are going to have more effectiveness in ministry, but the world is going to keep on getting evil, and more evil, and more evil. However, it should be noted there there will always be times of um, lapse of of evil. Like for instance, in America, you know, persecution stopped. Um, Whereas persecution had been going on for a while, America not so much, especially in light of the other places in the world that are being persecuted. Um, you know, and obviously that could go away sometime in the future. You know, obviously, um, and, and like for instance, uh, well, I don't want to get into that, but um, and then it could happen. It could happen somewhere else. Iraq could become the new center of peace. I mean, you really just don't know. Um, but also, don't be fatalistic. Every time something bad happens, I hear I hear a Christian say it's just a sign of the times. Oh my goodness, I'm so tired of hearing that. Yes, of course, you know, the, the world aches. And of course, there's there's the world has fallen and, and, and sinful and whatnot. But that doesn't mean you should just say, it's just a sign of the times. What can you do? Pray for them. Reach out to these people who are suffering. Like, like the whole refugee crisis right now from Syria. Well, it's just a sign of the times. Of course, it's a sign of the times. There will be trouble. Jesus said that. However, what can we do to fix this? You know what I mean? Jesus hasn't come back yet, which means he still wants us to be doing what he told us to do in the first place. Um, and three sixteen it says, all scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. These are things. Remember that he's talking about the Old Testament. So, um, as far as Second Peter. Um, <sighs> let's let's um, let, let's start with Saint Peter here. Um, as far as First Peter, I'm going to go under the assumption that he probably had an amanuensis that helped him, or someone who was helping him with the with the writing. I mean, maybe maybe Mark was there and Mark helped him smooth it over, because you know he does say Mark being with him. And remember that Mark and and Luke and 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 um, 
And Timothy, I really playing key parts in these last days of Peter and Paul. Um, you know, because remember, there's overlap of Peter and Paul both being in Rome, probably. Um, and so Mark, you know, goes with, and he's with Timothy there. I mean, um, uh, Peter for there for a while. Then he goes uh, to Paul uh, when he's on his deathbed. And uh, Luke was there, was there with, uh, with Paul. And it seems like uh, he left and came back and whatnot maybe a couple times. But it seems like he was there potentially until the end. Um, so, I mean, that's, that's pretty amazing. Um, uh, St. Peter does not have very good Greek in it. Um, and, 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 and once again, if, if, first, if first Peter shows Peter using an amanuensis, maybe second Peter shows Peter writing it himself, because um, it just doesn't have very good Greek. Um, people have also assumed that maybe um, it's possible that um, uh, after Peter, Peter was maybe compiling something or something, and then when he died, somebody came along and took his writings, and, and it was like a posthumous testament, like his, like his last testament, but they just kind of uh, put it together, in which case they didn't necessarily add anything, just make it into one letter and then send it out. Um, I mean, it's possible, uh, but with that, I would kind of wonder why it was still in good Greek, not not good Greek, unless first Peter was written by Peter and he was just good, he was a good writer of Greek, in which case Singham Peter would show that the person who uh, put it into one testament was bad at Greek. But once again, kind of speculative at this point. Um, audience, it seems like it was the same as First Peter because he mentions a previous letter in Second Peter. Um, if this is a different letter, we don't have that letter, and we don't know who it's going to then. Um, we can date it to about somewhere before 68. Seems like that's when the when the persecution started. But sometime after 64 is that's when it started. Or I think I said that wrong. Sometime before 68 because that's when it stopped. But sometime after 64 because that's when it started. I think I said it right that time. So the context, Peter writes to resolve fa false teaching before death. Um, special characteristics. Um, because situations were, were, were so quickly becoming worse and worse, many were reaching the conclusion, where is Christ? I mean, what's going on? Um, which, once again, a lot of the same Christians are in the same place today. Um, um, also, keep in mind that, the, that it's not always a neat, you know, this is the cult he's talking about. Well, as nice as that sounds, chances are it's more of a pagan conglomeration. People in the church, maybe, who, who are who are introducing heresies, people outside, people from the Jews, you know, just a conglomeration of ideas. Because, you know, that was like Greek. Greek was very... Um, it starts with an S. Um, um, were you taking other things? Um, oh, not systematic. Um... Basically, you know, um, uh, syncretistic. Uh, the Greek culture is very syncretistic, so it's not beyond the realm of possibility that the things that got into the churches were also syncretistic. Um, also, uh, Saint Peter has, has a lot to do with Jude. It seems like Jude was written first, and that Saint Peter or Peter used Jude uh, for chapter two. Uh, Read cha chapter two of Saint Peter, and then read Jude, and you'll see the similarities that I'm talking about. Um, Okay. And then, you know, that thing about the pagan conglomeration, that kind of works for a good majority of the uh, New Testament. The main theme is Christ is active and soon coming. Okay. Some difficult passages. Uh, 1, 8 through 9. For if you possess these quali qualities in measure, um, in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Um so it, it, what he's talking about here, and I'll keep on reading, but whoever does not have them is nearsighted and blind, forgetting that they have been cleansed from their past sins. Stagnant Christians temporarily closed their eyes. Stagnant Christians temporarily have become blinded. Now, once again, temporary in the sense that it can be reversed. Um, 116, for we did not follow cleverly devised stories when we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in power, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Personal experience on the Mount of Transfiguration. The, you know, the, this he, he talks about something personal. And, you know, faith should never be blind. We trust in God. But why? Because there's evidence for God. You know, as much as science, or I should say atheists, as much as atheists trump on evolution, 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 evolution is a non-issue to Christians. Who cares if it happened or not? 
how did it happen? Not that it happened, but how did it happen? Well, God. Regardless of whether God used evolution or not, God did it. So, I mean, it's a non-issue, but atheists get so wrapped up in evolution, the Bible doesn't absolutely demand that evolution can't be true. It just says that man was not evolved from something else. Man was created from the dust, and man um, received the breath of God. And that's the only thing with evolution that you really have to push, and that it didn't just randomly come together, as unlikely as that is. Scientifically speaking, that's just, you can't, science shows us that it's a very intelligent thing. Atheism is the thing that shows us that it couldn't have been God. Um, once again, because it, they, they come to science with the presupposition that it can't be God. Therefore, it's not God. Because any conclusion that they're going to reach is not God. But obviously, um, they shouldn't be blind. We, ha we have the evidence of the created world around us. We have the evidence of our conscience. We have the evidence of Jesus. We have the evidence of, once again, G Peter is saying, I saw this with my own eyes. Okay? I'm not just believing in some myth or some something that, you know, just a story like Homer's writings. This is something that I saw with my own eyes. See, we and we believe that. We believe the early church's, church's testament that they saw this, that they saw Christ resurrected. James, Jesus' brother, who didn't believe in his entire ministry, was converted and was converted after the ascension. What changed? Peter was that went out weeping, had no direction in life, and, and yet in, in a mere, what, 40 days? A couple months, somewhere around there, um, he he's in Jerusalem preaching. What changed? So, I mean, you see what I mean? The, the, something happened. Um, so he appeals to his personal experience, not blind faith. Faith should never be blind. Above, well, I shouldn't say never. There is always an element of blind faith in any faith system. There always is. But we shouldn't blindly believe something. Like, for instance, you, you shouldn't believe that... You shouldn't believe in a spaghetti monster. Why? Because there's there's no evidence for a spaghetti monster. There is a good a good amount of evidence for God. So believe in God. So I mean, it's not... Atheism is actually the small minority of people. Most people believe in a god, at least, or a conglomeration of gods. Um... Anyways, I'm getting off topic, but you know this is something that was a personal experience, and you know obviously Jesus warns about taking up the cross. You know it's a very serious thing, um, and so yes, there should we should be certain of what we believe before we, we choose to believe in it. Yes, um, however, keep in mind that with our Christian walk there is going to be times of faith. There's going to be times when we don't feel God. There's going to be times when we don't feel good. I mean, we have to walk by faith. And what does the Bible say? It says, I think five, or, I think it says like three or four times, the righteous will live or walk by faith, live by faith, walk by faith, something like that. The righteous will live by faith. Okay, it says it over and over again. I think that it's important. Now, what is faith? Faith is trust in God. The righteous person lives trusting in God. Okay, we don't believe in spaghetti monsters and that kind of nonsense, but the stuff that there is genuinely basis to believe. Like a miracle, something that happens outside of the normal event that is not repeatable and not testable. That's a possibility, especially if there's a divine being. So, um, the existence of God kind of demands the existence of miracles in a way. Uh, 120 says, um, if they have escaped... I'm sorry, is that 120? Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of scripture um, came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. He defends uh, prophecy in scriptures and inspiration. Um, I, I can't get into really what's going on in, in, in St. Peter. I think that Craig Blomberg does a great job of that once again. Plug uh, from Pentecost to Patmos. Definitely worth reading. Um, and pick up Jesus in the Gospels too. I mean, they, they're just, they're just, they're, it's part one and part two basically. It, it just Check it out. 2 5 says, um, If he did not spare the ancient world when he brought the flood on its ungodly people, but protected Noah, a preacher of righteousness, and seven others, um, once again, his defense of morality is that there's coming judgment. So don't don't live however you want because there's coming judgment. In three four, they will say, "Where is this coming?" He promised. Ever since our ancestors died, and everything goes on, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. So here, a defense of, the, of Christ's second coming. There's no solution of evil if God if Christ didn't, doesn't come. So. Um, but then in 3.9, we see that God does not enjoy the punishment. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some 
understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. He desires people to come to repentance. So God does not enjoy the punishment. Um, I know it's a very quick lesson today. Um, once again, try, kind of trying to figure out the spacing on these things. Um, the next lesson will be the last lesson. We'll talk about the the, um, the letters of John. Um, yeah.